And hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. I am, of course, Dr. Natalie Forrest, and you are here to watch the show, Misfit. Start living and thriving now. Remember, we've had a couple of shows. I explained a few things about revolutions. I explained what I mean and why I think I'm a misfit. And I also shared with you that I do want to give the stage, the spotlight to some people who in one way or another are also misfits. And it might not come across right away, but we'll get there. I'll get everybody to admit it. So today we're starting out the show with uh, a wonderful person that I had the pleasure to meet myself. And I probably should have asked her exactly how to pronounce her last name. So she'll correct me later on. Let me give you a little bit of introduction to Robin Chodak. Is that okay? <laughs> Okay, Robin Shodak, she is one of the most amazing people that I know because of what she has been through and how she has turned it around into helping others. You know, I always look for people who help others. So Robin left her job after 20 years as a computer software systems analyst following the suicide of her husband in 2005. Her journey through grief led her to transformation. She now loves to write and has published two books. Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving, which also won an excellent award in 2017 on the topic of grief, moving to excellent, a pathway to transformation after grief. I also follow her, by the way, on her Facebook group, which is, I believe, called Suicide Recovery. She's very active on Twitter and also I know tries to respond. So she's got a lot of really great information out there on a daily basis, all about suicide, grief, transformation, and being able to turn things around for as good as possible. But she'll talk more about that. She also does have, and I didn't even know that, an Android app to help reframe your thoughts called Think excellent thoughts. So I know I'm going to subscribe to that later on because it never hurts. After all that she's been through and that she's doing right now, Robin also led her to begin to dance. She's dancing tango, which resulted in her finding a new husband. I love this next number. They married on 11, 11, 11. I mean, how can that go wrong? And are blissfully happy. They live the winter month on the east coast of Florida and the summer month in Indiana. Her website is robinshodak.com. She has a lot of additional accolades to it, her name, to her experience, and all I can say is that I've met her, and that's why she's on the show, because to me, she's the real thing. So welcome, Robin. I appreciate you making the time and being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. It's, <laughs> it's amazing to, to hear all those things you said about me. I appreciate that greatly. And it has been great knowing you as well. And I know that we're on the same page on, in many facets of our life. And we all have had our personal transformation. And that's why we are doing what we do. And, and I think it's, it's, it's more of it's almost a, a necessity mm -hmm. yeah. to, to, to keep you thriving. And I know you love that word, thrive. <laughs> I do. I also love shifting and misfitting. I also want to point out one other thing that, that, that you do, uh, because I think it fits in, you know, with the transformation idea. Other than having met you as part of Transformation TV, you're also doing some of the shows for Transformation TV with other authors, with other people from the team. And the reason why I wanna bring that up is not just because we're going to have, and we are having so many really fascinating shows on Transformation TV that I invite everybody to look at, but the ones that you have done are, I guess, groundbreaking, I wanna say, because you started it and you're sharing that consistently. So. What made you want to be the interviewer, for lack of a better term, and to provide in your very generous way 
the spotlight to others. Let them share their message. What what made you go there? Oh, it's a it's a it's a good question, but I'll answer the second one first. Okay. <laughs> Sharing the spotlight. Well, I believe that you know we're not in competition with mm-hmm. anyone, and my philosophy is that if we continue to just you know share our experiences with one another, and and the best way we do that is through communicating. And that's why I, I write, okay? And that's mm-hmm. a, about writing. But, but I, I love to be able to, to communicate and share a message. And, you know, it's just great, Natalie. You were my first <laughs> guest. I mean, how <laughs> happy is that? I mean, you know, we, we connected on such a great level. And you were my first guest. So, therefore, it has to be successful. <laughs> It is so funny. I didn't even realize that. But yeah, now that you're saying it, that was not even on my mind. But that makes perfect sense. That's how the universe works. Absolutely. So in this instance, it actually fits. Well, okay. It fits. So how do you think your life has changed? Because you talk about grief. You, you, I'm sure you help thousands of other people because I know – when I see your posts, I'm moved or I'm starting to think, how has your life shifted or transformed since you started coming out um, after your husband's suicide? I mean, there was, I know there was a grief period, but what has changed in your life since then? Yes, and you know, you use that word coming out, and I, and I like that word because after Steve died, I was in a state of shock, first of all, mm-hmm. because, you know, I was the one to find him. Oh, yeah. So that inflicted that shock factor, that post-traumatic stress. Mm-hmm. And it was publicized in local newspapers. He was a politician. It was publicized in the Chicago Times, which is an, an oh. illustrative paper. Yeah. And so the stigma of that and then having my life in the newspapers and the suicide, it just made me even want to withdraw more. So there was a period of time that I just wanted to escape and didn't want anybody to know about it. So I never talked about it for a long time. And then I, I realized that I was going down this deep, dark tunnel and then I went and I sought help and I sought it by support groups um, by a counselor and just other people that could understand what I was going through and that's very important and that's why I started my own Facebook page and and back then it's it's hard to believe but back then we didn't have iPhones we didn't We didn't have these apps at our fingertips that we have now. And it was very difficult. I was calling churches. I was calling everywhere to find out if I can find a support group on suicide. I couldn't find any. And let me, can I interrupt you real real briefly? Um, I, I, I think what you're saying is so important. And do you think, based on what you just said, uh, you know, you said you had a hard time finding everything. And I know since 2005, there's been a lot more discussion about grief, about suicide, about depression, about needing assistance from others. I mean, we've talked a lot more about it. Do you think it's actually easier now to find support groups or is it just all in the public sphere, a lot of hype about it, but the challenges are still the same? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, yes and no, because I do get, I get people that, that come onto my page and they find me, mm-hmm. but they can't find a, a, a real live building. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, it's nice to have warm bodies around, but thankful, thankfully they find my page and, you know, I try to help them and you maybe seek a little deeper But yeah, I mean, there are more and more. And I was actually trained as a facilitator for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I was going to a, you know, a physical building Mm -hmm. where people meet. And I also did that. But yes, with the internet and with 
the social media. It, it's more at your fingertips. There's, it's easier to seek help now, okay? And there's so much more awareness about the suicide. But it's interesting because I made a video myself on my own page taking another spin on it because I have to caution the, the community because what they say is that suicide is preventable. Many, many, many are saying that. And I have to caution that because you know what that does to those that have been left behind? You know, you're nodding because it's the guilt. Yeah. That makes you feel more guilty. So I don't like that word. Because you know what, nothing, you cannot take anybody's choice away from them. And they have chosen to do that. And that's one of the things you must accept as you travel down this road through your journey. You must accept that you're not the one to blame. I think that's, that's, that, that's the guilt. I think that that's the, one of the main things that drives you down that dark and lonely road so how do you how did you get yourself out of it you were out there trying to seek help you were all of a sudden pushed into the public limelight because your husband was already a public figure i mean the pressures would seem insurmountable yes yes they were but little by little i learned that there's this power <laughs> that we have Mm -hmm. okay. it's within us and we, we, we don't understand so much the power of our brains and our thoughts and, and, and I use this analogy in my books and I talk about this a lot when I'm speaking I could write computer programs I mean that's what I did I wrote code and I programmed that and you know what if I put something bad in something bad would come out right. well our brains are the same way and I knew, I got to this place and I thought, if I continue down this road with these thoughts, these negative voices in my head, like little, little demons in there, right? Whatever you want to call them, this autopilot brain of ours that I was not going to get anywhere. But it's, you know, I may, I'm simplifying it, but it is the truth, okay? And that's the thing that I teach. You have to become aware of your thoughts. And, and you have to become aware of how you're feeling. Grief imposes a lot of different emotions and feelings in your body. So you have to ask your thought, yourself, what am I thinking? What is this thought? And then what is it causing me to do? So you kind of go down that road. And, and it's a journey. And it's, 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 you have to be willing to begin to, to change, to want to change, to want something better. Isn't that then where the real, I mean, like the additional challenge, come, challenge comes in? Because we already know in life in general, so many people are on autopilot. I mean, that's, you know, they're on autopilot. They don't even know what they're doing, which is why I talk about detoxing the mind. You talk also about the same thing. You're using it. You become aware of your thoughts. So if people in general already are, struggling with that in a pretty, I don't know, normal or autopilot kind of life anyhow, where in many ways they're existing and they're just going, how can they dig themselves out of even stronger autopilot forces? I mean, that, that's, I think that's really what you're talking about. You're not just saying you're on autopilot because you're existing. You're saying you're on autopilot because you're existing. And now you're on autopilot for the grief and the cycle of grief. Right. Yes. And Can you do that by yourself or do you need real good friends or help or what's the best way? Well, absolutely. You need, you need something, mm -hmm. okay? Something or someone to help you discover that there's something wrong, you're stuck. Now, now grief is the normal response to loss. And when you have loved someone deeply, you are going to grieve deeply. And that is a process. But we're not designed to stay stuck in that grief. And what I find when I work through my, with my clients is that it's not the grief that's 
keeping them stuck now. It's something that we had to go dig into and find out. And it's basically some belief that they're carrying about themselves or about something else. And that keeps them stuck. So processing your grief, okay, that's normal. And you need to go through that. You need to, you don't want to deny it. And I, and I say that grief will become your greatest teacher. That's what I say. I put that out. You know, I put posts out about that. It's your right. greatest but you know what you need to do you need to take it by the hand and walk with it every day so it will teach you so you need to begin to listen you need to begin to listen and you know like you said we're always on autopilot we never listen until something stops us in our tracks and it's sadly oftentimes it's tragedy and then we can begin to listen. And then this gives us an opportunity for transformation. And that's my goal. I don't want anybody to stay stuck, you know? I mean, that's really what it's about. That's why I do what I do, because I've been there. And I know what that feels like. And I know that you can. You can learn to live and love life after loss. That's my tagline, love life after loss. Love life after loss. And you can, and it is possible. I'm not the only one. I wish I could say I was the only one <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> but then you're not doing your job. If you were the only one, you wouldn't be doing your job. So no, you don't want to be the only one. Uh, so for the people who feel the guilt, you know, because afterwards is always, there's always the, the internal and external conversation about, well, why didn't you see where there are no signs? It's almost like playing a blame game. And especially, of course, if you're already in the public eye, okay? So it's this blame game. And then some people will move out of your life because of that. Others might come in. If you're really, however, finding yourself alone, and so you got that in your head, what are some of the, I don't know, activities or, or things that, that you recommend somebody engages in to slowly but surely break out of that? Well, one of the, I have a 10-step process in my, my second book. My, this is my first book you mentioned, Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving. Yeah. yeah. And then this is the second book that's mm -hmm. on Transformation TV. And, well, it's on Amazon, but it was written so that people could get the videos that we've all created and it's a 10 step process and one of the steps is you must begin to do the things you love and you know you might not even know what you love to do but this is this is a, a playground now for you mm -hmm. to begin to explore now i already used to dance when steve was alive but i did not dance tango <laughs> but now you do and you're yeah. good at it Yes, thank you. And, and that's what happened. I, I needed to begin to do something new. And, you know, I believe that people come at the right time. They say the right things. And someone came to me. She actually lost her fiancé to suicide. So, of course, I could trust her. And she said to me, she said, Robin, you need to dance again. And I said, well, I can't. I can't go back to the, those places. Everybody knows me. They know my story. I can't. And she said, why don't you try tango? Mm. And you know what? I listened. I tried tango and it changed my life. Because, you know, it's such a metaphor for, for where we are and how we can dance out of our pain into joy. And you're, you're being held and, and a lot of your needs are being met. But you don't even have to speak to the other person. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, yeah. I mean, I, I used to dance a lot. You know, the way I grew up, it was part of what we did. But I often dance in the rain. Mm. And, and to me, that's almost like a cleansing. You know, and, and I do that sometimes with my daughter. Of course, it's easier, you know, if you're with your daughter, nobody looks at you like you're crazy. <laughs> when I used to do that by myself, people would look at you like, what are you doing? You're a grown woman dancing in the rain. But um, I think just being able to do that, you know, whether it's tango or the walls or just in, in some kind of, of public place, just sort of letting it loose and letting it out. Um, we don't do that enough anyhow. 
And then, like you said, in some dances, I guess there's that, that connection as well. You don't have to know the other person or talk to them, but there's something that automatically connects you. And, and I think that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, and, and that's what you need. That's, you need that when you're going through grief. You need to have a connection. I'm not suggesting that you need tango, you may, but what I'm <laughs> suggesting is that you need to have a connection with someone, okay, because you don't want to isolate yourself. So I always caution about that. It's good to be alone. We need, we need um, self-reflection time, but when we stay alone too long, that's not good in the beginning periods of grief. And the other thing that's very important is to, to get out in nature. I'm a big advocate of nature, it's very healing. And actually that's why I have my cover on the beach because yeah. basically, basically I walked my way to transformation. <laughs> I walked and 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 walked on the beach in solitude. Listen. And you're also bicycling though. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm with you on the walking, I'm with you on the nature, and then there's like you bicycling. And it's not just you bicycling around the corner, but you cycle. Yes. So yeah. how does that happen when you cycle, even though there may be 20, 30 people around or just one other person, you're still sort of just, it's just you and the bike and maybe nature or whatever, right? Sounds so, like you're my foot, Natalie. <laughs> Okay, maybe I did. You no, know, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so, so how? Where does that fit in? Is that is that step one or step eight? To to begin to bike. To or bike or be out in nature. Oh <laughs> no, that's actually that's down the totem pole. I, I would say you know it's about step nine. Step okay. Nine. But but biking, you know, I, I it's so funny because. I say it's meditative and people freak out. They're like, how do you meditate on the bike? I'm like, I don't close my eyes, but I have to tell you, I, I get so many messages and I basically have written my books on my bike. Wow. The thoughts come and sometimes I just have to stop and write it down. I learned the hard way because I was writing, writing one day and I thought, no, I've, I've got 15 miles to get till I get home and I'll write it down when I get home. Totally lost it. So, 50, 50, did you just say 15 miles? Yeah, I, I'll write about 30, 30 to 40 a day. Okay, okay, just checking. Okay. I, I feel like a couch potato right now, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I get messages, you know, and I listen and, and I just write it down because I really believe that when we begin to listen to our inner self, mm -hmm. our inner spirit, I mean, that's where all the, the healing. And the transformation comes anyway. And so that's really how I live my life. I mean, I'm, I'm very much guided by the spirit. And I, I talk a lot. I mean, I have so many things I could talk about, but I know you don't have time. But 1111 is very significant. And that's why I got married on 111111. Yeah, when I saw that number, I'm like, what? That's yeah. like whenever I, I look at the clock and it's 11, 11 or something like that, I'm like, oh, yay. You know, um, so wh why, don't you, why don't you share a little bit about what 11, 11 means or what it means to you? Okay. Well, I started writing my book, my memoir, about 12 years ago mm -hmm. after Steve died. I started writing and I'm actually turning my memoir into a novel. Wow. And I'm going to get it published i don't have a publisher yet but it will be published but i've been this has been a work in process for 12 years mm -hmm. and, it's, it, and it's my story and i want my story to be out there because it's important to tell our story but after steve died i began to see 11 11 on the clock mm -hmm. when a beatles song came on and you say well why a beatles song well he was a guitar player and he loved the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So, and then I was feeling, feeling this presence. And it wasn't that feeling of that deep pain any longer. Mm -hmm. The feeling of comfort. And I knew that it was his energy around me. And from that day on, I had always, always seen 11, 11 on the clock at least once a day. At least I see it numerous times a day. Yeah. I mean, 
we only have 11, 11 twice, but I'll see it like, oh, you have a, 111, anything with ones, because yeah. 111 emails or the license plates, you know, 111, it's always something. But for me, it's my guiding force. And we all have our own. It's just a matter of, you know, beginning to listen to that spirit. And that spirit is what will transform us, our inner spirit. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, you keep pointing that out, and I think it's so important. It's the part about listening to ourselves. Uh, and whether it's in grief, like you've experienced, and, and all of those who are fortunate enough to work with you, you're, of course, guiding them through that. It's also important in daily life that we need to take a step back or there are other forms of, um, you know, wake up calls as I like to refer to them where uh, if all of a sudden you can't go to work because you've got a headache. It's not just take a pill. It's why do I have a headache? As silly as that seems where, you know, we have sayings back home about headaches and, you know, when our noses are stuffy and all of that, it has specific meanings. From culture so I think listening to oneself and I guess in a sense you're really talking about the rediscovery of who you are right oh absolutely yes yes I like that you said that because I do say that I said we we we, we recover from who whom we've lost because we already have been created mm -hmm. in a perfect way mm -hmm. okay we're perfect when we're created. Yeah. But then because of all these beliefs and all these things that happen in our life, it changes us. So when we're transforming, we're, we're getting back to really who we should be. And then when I always say what we are, we are expressions of love. We're expressions of love. So, so my job is to be able to share that love, share my story, share that love so I can help someone else. And it goes back to why I do what I do on Transformation TV, because I get to share your story. Mm -hmm. I get to share another person's story. So if we just keep sharing the love, you know, it's, it sounds so trite, but it's really the truth because that's who we are. We are expressions of love. And that, that is, I think, what a lot of people will forget that a very simple gesture, you know, a smile is an expression of love, as, as you just stated. And sometimes just that smile to a complete stranger can change their life and they are thereby it's being reflected right back onto you and it changes what you want to do next time. Um, now, you share a little bit about your story and, and how, you, how you found your, your husband and how all of a sudden you were in all of this public domain, uh, you know, withdrawing and, and sort of slowly but surely coming out. Um, what about fear? And what I mean by that is you've lost someone that you love dearly. Uh, you know, and I, I know you'll have to do, you, you're dealing with that with some of your clients as well. The fear then of, for example, what if I lose another person? Can I deal with that? Or if it's a husband or, or a wife, if it's a spouse, is there no lingering fear about getting involved again and losing that person too? Well, that's, that's a good question as well, because especially in the beginning, I myself had this and a lot of my clients, uh, let's say I was trying to call my mom. I couldn't get her on the phone. I feared something happened to her. It's, just, it's, 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 it's almost a normal response. Okay, but again, if you continue to live in that realm of fear, you're never going to be moving forward because that will keep you stuck. And so, yeah, we, you know, we can have fearful thoughts all the time. We watch the news. We can get fearful thoughts, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, what do you do about them? You know, how long are you going to let them linger in your mind? Because first of all, you have to be aware what is this thought? This is always the question. What is this thought causing me to do or feel? You know, I'm getting angry or I'm this or I'm that. And, and so that's inflicting the fear. So you have to think about the thought you're having, okay? And, and when you really start to break it down, there really is no fear. 
you know, I don't think, I don't really fear anything. I don't worry anything. I don't anymore. No, I mean, I, it sounds crazy, but you know why? It just takes too much energy. I've used it all up. I don't want, I don't want that kind of energy anymore. I just don't. And I've learned how to, you know, work through it. I mean, it's been a long journey, but hey, I don't want to go back. And as soon as I catch myself, see, you know, it'll happen. But you know what? I catch myself. And it's like, how, do, I, do I really want to go back down that road again? Do I want to take backward steps? No. So we get, we get challenges all the time. It's just life. You know, you get challenges. But the great news is, is once you've learned something, it's in your memory. It's mm -hmm. in your you can say, wait, I had a positive result from doing this, from thinking this, from feeling this. So I need to do that again because it goes back to paying attention. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I saying? What am I saying to myself, right? What's that talk? What are we saying to ourselves? And when we're in grief, we're often not saying self-love things, okay? So I'm a big advocate of self-love, you know? You, you need to love yourself. You have to go back to that, you know? And so that's what I help my clients do. I help them get back to that place. Like you said earlier, you know, you got to – I forgot what you called it. And it's not reborn. You said something. You know, you got to get back to Yeah. Rediscover yourself. Yeah, that's yeah. what you got to get back to that. Mm -hmm. Even though society tells us not to. Right. Yes. So in, in the work that you do very clearly, I mean, you, you've, got, you've got degrees, you're, you're a certified practitioner, facilitator, you're a best-selling author. You also talk a lot about energy, which personally I love. <laughs> Just like, you know, our mind is very strong. So if I keep fearing something, I'm going to create that, right? Um, but you talk a lot about energy, and so do you use any sort of energy healing when you're working with clients, for example? Um, I don't do that with my clients. Mm -hmm. um, that's not my like. If I wanted to do that, then I would be marketing myself as a Reiki practitioner, but I don't want to solely do that. I, I, I'd like to consider myself more as a, a coach. Okay, I'm coaching them because I mean I like Reiki and I do Reiki. I do it on I do it on my friends and my family. Okay, I mean I could do it on my clients if they asked me to, but I most of my clients are over the phone. Mm -hmm. I mean I could do distant Reiki, but that's um, just not what I do. Now I do like I said I'm a practitioner. I do it for myself, but I'm not. That's not my main focus. Okay, but I understand. The energies and I know it's very powerful a lot of my friends are that's their practice mm -hmm. okay. and, and and it gets it gets good results okay but for me the coaching because I've been in this place and I know that I needed that and I needed the people I needed to to rediscover like you said and that that takes a lot of talking bringing it to the surface and the reason I love coaching so much is because it, it does what I believe in. It empowers you. It's going to empower you. If you're my client, you're going to come to me. You're going to leave after working with me and you're going to say, Robin, my life has changed because you know what? You have become empowered and now you can do and achieve what you want in your life. And that's why I love coaching because it's like a gift. It's a gift I can give to someone. I'm going to help that person become better, you know, make the world better. That's why I love, you know, TTV. We're going to make the world better. And that's why we're working with TTV now. And, this is, and that's why we're all here, because we believe in it. And that is so crucial because uh, I often hear people worrying, you know, what else is this person going to do? What else is that coach going to do? But if you're in full integrity like you are, you're like, no, this is what I do. And this is my special gift for people who are going through grief. And the way that you're describing it, I, I love the passion when you say that. Now, this is what I do because it does take the talking. And I know a lot of people don't like to use the word. It actually takes work. Um, and it's not like 
work where you have to be outside like carpentry or anything like that, but you have to go through, in your instance, that, that very well-proven 10-step program. You know, these are the things you need to go through. And I would assume that even though it's a step-by-step -step program that some people go faster through it than others, and therefore, it always has to do with how open are we, and that is, I couldn't agree more, where you need the real person there, you know, the expert the, who is compassionate as well. Yes, yes. And, and, you know, I always feel that it doesn't matter. I believe in the, you know, that the, the, they say the term, you know, laws of attraction, whatever you want to call it. I just believe that the right people will come to me. I give a 20-minute free consultation. Mm -hmm. and, and I want them, if they want to work with me, I want to work with them. We, and I use the word energies again. Because there's an energy yeah. that exists. And, and, and I believe that the right people will come to me. The right people will come to you. So therefore, there is no competition. Right. I don't need to worry, you know? <laughs> yeah, we can share, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Robin, um, do you consider yourself a misfit in any way, shape, or form? Well, yeah, I was a misfit totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Now then, of course, the next question, once you realize you're a misfit, how did you deal with really living and thriving and having this amazing giving life that, that you're having now? Was that a natural or did you, did you fight being a misfit? Well, you know, it's funny because I still feel like a misfit. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why you're on the show. To me, it's an easy one. <laughs> No, because it's like, you know, I, I feel that a lot of my thoughts, they're, they're so far from mainstream, mm -hmm. you know? And, and even I think that some of the things that I teach or say, people have never heard them. So it, it, it appears that perhaps I am a misfit. And yeah, I mean, I think that we're always resisting, resisting, resisting until we get to that place. Well, hey, this is not working. You know, we can't keep resisting. And you just begin... You just begin to live your passion, you know. And, and then, and, and then the other thing I say is, you you live, you be authentic. And so it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks of me if they think I'm a misfit. It doesn't matter because I, I have to be who I am and live my truth. Right? We have to live truths. So you know, I mean, I was a misfit before. I, I'm gonna I'm certainly one now. So I guess it doesn't matter. So you're just embracing oh yeah that's who i am yeah yeah and then i think you know when more misfits come together that's the wave that that i keep seeing uh, where the norm no longer applies just like you're guiding people through grief in your way because you've gone through it so you can actually say this works there are other books out there, but this is the one that really works. It's not theoretical, which is why you're also working on your biography, of course. But it's like, this is really, it has helped me and it can help you. It's a very different approach. And it also is that honesty about coming out and speaking about it. So do you think that everybody that you work with, because you mentioned earlier, every story needs to be shared. Do you think that everybody you work with would benefit from writing their story or in one way or another, publicizing their story? Well, um, I shouldn't have said every story needs to be shared. That was, I shouldn't have said that because I don't believe that. I think that it's important for us to tell our stories when we can, mm -hmm. okay? Because not everybody, is called or, 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 or is led to do it, okay? Um, I have been and others have been and that's why we write books. Okay? That's why I'm writing my memoir because I am called to be writing this book to help others because they're going to resonate with it. And, and, and a lot of times we, we listen to people, we read books because we resonate and we say to ourselves, oh my gosh, I don't feel so all alone now. They just experienced, they're thinking, they went through what I was thinking that I was so afraid to talk about. 
they're thinking thoughts that I thought that I'm embarrassed about or whatever. So, you know, I think that when someone is able, it's a good thing because it can be beneficial and help. And I always <laughs> believe that writing, see, writing is good because you, it's to yourself and you don't have to publicize it, but it's very therapeutic. And, and after Steve died, I started writing to him. I would write letters. I have a book filled of letters to him. And it was quite interesting because I didn't realize I had a gift or the skill of writing. I used to write technical manuals at work and I didn't realize that I had this creative side. And so this whole journey, you know, over these 13 years, I've gone to writing schools and had writing coaches. And I, I found that I had this gift that I could write and I could speak and I could do these things I didn't think I could. Because, yeah. because what happens is after you, you know, remove these blockages, remove these stuck states, we become more creative. And I was just in my interview with um, Patricia, Madalena, we were, we were talking about this very thing because this creative spirit comes out of us, you know? So it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And I think in so many ways, you're giving voice to many of the people who are experiencing grief, to many of the people who are looking at suicide of a loved one or just even hear about it. And they don't know whether they should have done something, should have not done something. And to me, it's like the work that you're doing is not just for the person, this is not the right word, so forgive me, um, that is directly impacted because their spouse, for example, committed suicide. But it can also be a friend or even a distant friend or somebody, you know, a, a classmate from 20 years ago. There's still that ripple effect. And it seems to me that those people as well may benefit from some of your insights, even if it's not direct in that, you know, I mean, it's removed whatever, like 20 years, but you knew that person and you're like, what, what happened? And, and it's another awakening. So yeah, I think you give voice to a lot of the issues that are especially right now at the heart of society. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're right. It, it's, we've had things that have happened to us in the past that maybe we've never dealt with, you know, maybe, you know, they didn't, if, if it happened 20 years ago, you know, they never dealt with it. This good friend of mine, she lost her mother when she was, you know, like 13. And this was many, many years ago. Nobody talked about it then. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was brushed under the covers and it wasn't until later in life. I mean, she used to, and I put this in my book, she used to say on medical forms that her parents, um, I forgot, she never said that they died by suicide. She would lie. She would lie because of the stigma. So, you know, we do have a voice, absolutely. You know, and I know that's what you like to do too. You give voice. And I'm, yeah. you're doing the show. You're giving me my voice. I'm usually <laughs> the one that's interviewing. So it's nice to be interviewed, Natalie. Thank you. Well, yeah, your voice needs to be heard, not just in the books that you write, not just in your transformation TV show and, and your speaking engagements, because I know you have a, a very big one coming up with the crews, but I think in general, it's so important. So why don't you mention to some people or to everybody, the one thing I know most of us who interview others, you know, we say, what is like the one thing? that you want to let people know, not just those that you directly deal with necessarily because of grief, but what do you think is the one key to life that allows people to be happy, to, to live, to thrive? What is the one piece of advice that you would have for people? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. And I have a million things running in my head. <laughs> I'll pick one. <laughs> A lot of running in my head but I guess the one that just kind of jumped out at me right away when you were saying that I would say live your truth mm -hmm. and if you don't know your truth search for your truth, yeah. live your truth. thank you for that I think that's very important live your truth Robin um, 
I, you know, I have a lot more questions, but I got to be mindful of the time. <laughs> so how can people reach you? Where can they find you other than on transformation TV? I mean, you're, you're a spotlight in there. You've got your show, you've got the book that you wrote, which is also on Amazon, of course. Well, how else can they reach you? What's the best way to reach you? You mentioned a 20 minute discovery session. So how do they get anything out there? Just, you know, it's very easy because my website is my name. So it's www.robin, R-O-B-I-N, Chodak. You did pronounce it right, Natalie. C-H-O-D-A-K, one word, robinchodak.com. And they can find me. It's, you can Google me and I'll pop up in a lot of places because I've had written other publications and just different things. You'll find me. But yeah, my website is probably, you know, I keep it up to date. I'm not like some people that let it go. I, I post all our videos out there and I keep it up to date. So that would be the best place. They can sign up for my blog. They can st stay in contact with me. Follow me on Twitter. But everything, you know, it's hard. Okay, I'm not going to say go to Twitter, go to Instagram, go to LinkedIn. Just go to my website and everything's there. And then I will highlight your Twitter because I love your Twitter. I mean, I'm just saying because, you know, I see you on Twitter and, and like I said earlier, the comments that, that, that you post there, the thoughts, the videos, um, you know, I think they're very insightful. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally want to thank you for that. I'm not in a process of grieving right now, but I think a change of thought, a change of pace is always good. So usually when you pop up there, I'm like, oh, okay. And whether I'm, I'm in full agreement or I take a breath. So thank you for that. I, I do follow you. <laughs> Thank you. And I follow you as back. It's great. Yeah. So Robin, I want to thank you again. You made the time. I think it's kind of hard for me to try and figure out how to summarize everything that you said, but most of all living your truth. And I think you're exemplifying that as the misfit that you are. <laughs> and I want to also thank you for taking the, the time and, and sharing encourage your experience because I know that that also cannot be easy out in a public eye. So thank you for that and everybody who's watching now, watching later, robinshodak.com, also on Transformation TV, she's got the app, she's got her Facebook group, so lots of ways to get in touch with her. Please do. And that means also go over to Transformation TV anyhow. There are lots of us out there who have come together in a, in a spirit of oneness and collaboration because we want to be able to help you live, thrive, be happy, and get all the resources you need to make that happen. So as I always say, one of the most important gifts that you can give somebody is time. Robin just gave us her time. And I want to thank you all for giving me and us your time to listen, be in touch, write a note, let us know, let me know what else you want to talk about. And until then, just have a revolutionary day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Natalie. You're welcome.